All right, so advanced encryption standard AES is most probably the most used encryption algorithm. So let's see how it works. It is a substitution permutation network and recall that it had three layers, key addition, which combines key material with the plain text, substitution layer, which provides confusion. And this is most of the time where the cryptanalyst tries to you know, obtain more info and try to break. Permutation provides diffusion. There are many SPN ciphers like AES and present. So recall that this was the picture you perform rounds many times. So advanced encryption standard, the origin name is Rindel, which comes from the names of the designers. So it was designed by two Belgian, John Damon and Vincent Raymond, and it is standardized in uh, 2001 by NIST. So it won the AES competition. This is why it is now called AES or advanced encryption standard. There were some uh, famous finalists, Serpent, Twofish, RC6, and Mars. These algorithms can also you know, come up when you use libraries like OpenSSL and so on. Currently, they are all secure, but you know we prefer to use the ES. It has a block size of 128 bits. Key lengths, which were defined by NIST before the competition, were like this. So it is 128, 192, and 256. And depending on the key choice, the number of rounds increases. So if you are using 128 bit, you have 10 rounds. If you choose this, it is this. There are many attacks. So we analyzed this cipher more than 20 years now. There are some attacks, but almost all of them are ineffective. So this is why we keep using it. We represent AES as a, as a four by four matrix. So these are can be seen as uh, bytes. So 16 bytes represented like this. And we perform operations on these boxes. So a round function of AES consists of key addition, subbytes, shift rows, and mixed columns. So this two part provides diffusion, but the first one provides diffusion on the rows, the other one on the columns. And the decryption is just inverse of these operations. Okay. So the key schedule, this is the picture I took from uh Nusan's book, Block Cipher Companion, is like this. So you have the 128-bit key. So this key actually uh, bytes are you know rotated to right here. Then S-box operation is performed. A round constant is added, and this value is XOR to other values. So now this is your so this is your initial round key, the master key also. Then this is your next round key, and you repeat this step for every round. So when you have the round key like this one here, since your actually uh, block size is 128 bits, your also round key is like that. So you actually exit it byte by byte or you know bit by bit. It doesn't matter since the sizes are identical. You just exit them and write it the corresponding place. Then you perform sub bytes. So you take the byte, put it into an S box, and obtain the result. This S box is really good. It is defined like this. So this table actually shows you how the S box work. For instance, if your input is three being hexadecimal, you go to third row and beat column and look at the value and say that this is the output. So this S box is chosen as the inversion of the input byte X when viewed as an element of Galois field two to the eight. And this S box provides optimal resistance against linear and differential cryptanalysis. So it is an open question if you can find a better 8x8 eight eight S box which provides better security against differential or linear cryptanalysis. So shift rows, you keep the first row identical. And next row, you rotate it one byte to the left. So you take this one and put it here like this. You shift this one two rows and you shift this one three bytes, sorry, not rows. So this way you provide some diffusion in the rows, but this is not enough. Then you take each column and multiply it with a matrix and write it back to the same column. Okay, and matrix is defined like this. And M is derived from the parity check matrix of a maximally distance separable code. So it comes from coding theory actually, but uh, this choice allows us to have better resistance against cryptanalysis because Although it is beyond the scope of this lecture, M's feature about branch numbers is important for us. So this branch number actually tells uh, at least how many bytes will be modified when you modify 
a few bytes in the input. Okay. So if you look at the whole run function of AES, you have the you know the input, you add round key, then perform S box operation, sub bytes, then you shift everything to left, rotate actually, then multiply columns with the matrix M and obtain the result. So this is one round of AES. So efficient AES implementations are successfully provided on many software and hardware platforms. Still lightweight block ciphers are necessary for constraint devices. So since 2010, there are CPU level hardware instructions for AES. This is because USA made it a must for state officials to keep their hard drives encrypted all the time. This is important because when your laptop is stolen at the airport, you know, official documents leak. This is why they, uh, you know, force everybody to keep their hard drives uh, encrypted all the time. But if you use your CPU to encryption and decryption like this for full disk encryption, you get a performance loss, which is between 20 to 40%. So it really affects your, uh, you know, experience. So for this reason, Intel and AMD provided hardware level AES instructions on their CPUs called ASNI, new instruction set. So uh, there was an initial uh, paper about it. I think this was it. So at this, in 2013, ah, no, this, yeah, this one. In 2010, uh, Intel showed that using a i7 CPU, using all of the cores on the CPU, they can obtain 100 gigabits per second on a single CPU. So this is a huge number, right? And if you have newer CPUs with less cores, you also come close to it. So when we look, by the way, each core have these instructions. So if you have 10 cores, then you get 10 times more parallel encryption speed. So in practice, people always compare these results with GPUs since GPUs have a lot of cores. Uh, people show that they can beat uh, software implementations, but they didn't focus on hardware implementation. So a lot of papers published actually couldn't compete with Intel CPUs anyway. So some people obtained a lot of better results. So for instance, this is result from my paper. I achieved 878 gigabits per second on a single GPU. This looks like eight times better than this. But this is not a fair comparison because this GPU uses a lot more electricity than a CPU, right? So a better comparison would be to divide your gigabit per second per watt by looking at the top watt that device can use because GPUs, you know, use more than 200 watts, but uh, CPUs are around, you know, 60, 90, sometimes 100 and so on. So here you can see that for this uh, CPU, we obtain around two gigabits per second per watt. So CPUs are really good. So these instructions are really good. So at the server, you can use these uh, instructions to you know, encrypt and decrypt everything without any cost. But if you are going to use your CPU cores at your server for other purposes, putting just the GPU next to it as a co-processor and outsourcing the encryption and decryption would be fantastic. You wouldn't use your any CPU core for encryption and you get all the encryption and decryption free. 